I, thank you all so much for being here. I, I sure appreciate you taking the time to come out tonight. Uh, if the sign didn't give it away, I'm Councilmember Patrick Martin. Uh, I represent the east side of Bloomington. Uh, so District 4 is pretty much everything uh, east of 35W. Uh, this is my second term, so I'm about halfway through my second term, so five years on the council altogether. Uh, and again, it's, uh, it's a really cool deal to see people taking an interest in their city and the work that's going on, wanting to ask questions, and taking time uh, out of Monday night to come and do it. So I really appreciate that. Uh, just by way of background, uh, so my day job, uh, I work in nonprofit fundraising. So I work with Second Harvest Heartland. Uh, it's the biggest food bank in the state of Minnesota. So pretty much any frontline food shelf in the Twin Cities area, we supply uh, the food. And that's actually how I got into uh, working with the city of Bloomington to begin with, especially through uh, service on the Advisory Board of Health, on the Parks and Recreation Commission. Very long story short, I was working at uh, the food bank on West 7th Street over in St. Paul, and I just noticed how many of the folks we were serving that were Bloomington residents. And especially there was a lot of seniors who had maybe lost a spouse or medication costs were out of control. And they would come all the way to St. Paul because they didn't want their neighbors to know that they needed that support, um, that they wanted to keep that to themselves. So I, I dug in, saw not only the need, but the tremendous potential in the community um, and have been incredibly blessed to be able uh, to work supporting not only our residents, uh, but kind of the entire region uh, since then. So. We're gonna talk about a little bit of that tonight. Uh, and folks coming in, yeah, feel free to submit questions. There's a basket in the back. Uh, we will hit those. I'm just gonna do some quick headlines here, things that are going on in the district, and then we'll get to that Q&A. Uh, so, that was the welcome. Uh, I just wanted to touch really briefly, and I hope you all have had a chance to check it out close up, but the Wee Mural that was unveiled uh, over in South Loop, it's just off of 30th. It is such a perfect symbol for the work that's going on in District 4 over the past few years particularly, but the momentum we're building moving forward. So there's this huge 752 foot long blank wall on the edge of an XL Energy power station. And we said, okay, a little bit of an eyesore, especially in this burgeoning neighborhood, we're investing a lot in public art. What can we do to take this eyesore and make it a tremendous asset for the community? To take what would be a drag and make it a propeller moving that neighborhood forward. So partnering with our Creative Placemaking Commission, with XL Energy, uh, and with uh, a group of local artists, uh, the USI Creative, they turned into one of the largest single murals, not only in the state of Minnesota, but in the country. And the mural itself reflects the cultural diversity that's driving the growth of Bloomington moving forward. So not to, not to spend too much time on it, but if you haven't had a chance to take a look, take a look, because that's exactly what we're doing, not only in District 4, but throughout the city take what traditionally has been maybe neglected or overlooked and think creatively on how we can turn that into an asset and a driver for the city moving forward a generation. So tonight, uh, in terms of the headlines, we'll cover some of the major developments that you've seen throughout District 4, and there's quite a few of them. Uh, we'll touch quickly on the I-494 uh, project coming up here because there's always gonna be a project on I-494. This one's a particularly important one. Uh, the Expo coming up, the 2023 budget, and the situation we have right now with artistry. Uh, and I'll try and hit the headlines uh, here quick, so again, we can get to that Q&A. So, first off, uh, again, that uh, District 4 pretty much stretches about over to 35W here, is the northeast quadrant of the city. And a lot of the development that you're gonna see incorporates, to a very large extent, uh, mixed-use residential development. So just a little bit of background on this. Probably one of the things I'm proudest of in my time on council was called the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. So the OHO, as we call it now, was a really innovative approach to try and figure out how we can make Bloomington a hospitable and affordable place for folks across the income spectrum. So at the time I first came on council, we were seeing statistics that about 70% of Bloomington residents got up and left from nine to five and then came back at the end of the day. And about the same proportion, especially in the hospitality industry, were coming into work. So we said, okay, sounds like a bedroom suburb, very nice, but what a missed opportunity. What if we could capture that economic and civic activity of all those folks that were leaving all those hours, or all the folks that just came here for the workday, what if they could live, work, and play here? Now, obviously, affordability is the huge part of that, uh, of that problem that we had to crack. Uh, and without spending a ton of time on it, there's really uh, only been one major way to encourage affordability in developments, and that was just to take big bags of cash and throw it at developers, and just cross your fingers that they made the place even remotely livable for folks on average incomes. But working creatively again, and working with staff in particular, we said, why don't we lower the overall cost of the development so that the developer can just pass those savings on to the renters in that building? 
We're not having to beg them to do it. We're simply making it make sense for the pro, pro, pro forma. So say you make the unit size just slightly smaller so you can fit more of them in the same footprint. Uh, or say if a parking spot's gonna take almost 20 grand to build, you only need to build say 96% of what you would have otherwise had to because there's a giant bus line right next to the building that folks can use. And altogether, it has been a massive success story, making sure that again, folks across the income spectrum can call Bloomington home, can put down roots, and can be the generation that moves forward and drives our growth and development. Lindell Flats is a tremendous example. So that's, uh, it opened up in January, 2022. It's over on Lindell Avenue. That's 81 units that are all affordable at 60% of what's called area median income. So without getting all jargony on it, uh, AMI is essentially just what are most people making in the community? So 100% AMI for Bloomington for a family of four is $118,000 a year. 60% AMI is about $70,400 a year. So for example, a brand new first year teacher, uh, my cousin started his career in the Bloomington School District a couple years ago, made about $43,000 a year. So when we say affordable housing, that's also kind of a misnomer. That's literally people just getting started in their careers, maybe just launching a family. A brand new police officer across the region makes about $63,000 a year. So when we talk about these developments, whether it's Lindale Flats or Cadence that went up on Old Cedar Avenue, all units affordable at 30 to 60% AMI. All these developments that we're seeing on the east side are welcoming in a new generation, again, to put down roots and be the folks that are going to drive the community's future overall. And it gets, uh, there's even more opportunity beyond that. As we look to continue to diversify the overall economic drivers of the city of Bloomington, I mean, thank gosh we have such a strong hospitality industry, but making sure that it's well-rounded and sustainable, taking projects like the Crown Plaza there, they said, well, uh, we're, we're looking to convert 185 of these units. How can we make it happen? And staff was incredibly forward-thinking, very creative, and we put together code that allowed them to do it, and 46 of those are affordable at that exact same AMI. So the hotel business is gonna to continue to thrive and 185 of those units are gonna have long-term residents, again, that are putting down roots in Bloomington. Carbon 31, uh, the fourth phase of the big residential project at Bloomington Central Station. Again, there's an affordability component there. And after years and years of folks asking for it, we're finally getting a grocery store on the far east side of Bloomington uh, with the Oxendales there. Uh, it's a, a huge victory story of that neighborhood in particular, generating enough density where a grocery store could look at the numbers and say, I think there's enough people that'll shop here. And that's only gonna improve moving forward. Uh, Riser is heading up across the street. Uh, that's gonna be independent senior rental apartments. Uh, Solo, just down the road, 183 units. And the Arter over on American Boulevard. Uh, and it's also looking at what is especially East Bloomington what do we see for ourselves? Ardor is gonna be on what's currently airport fly and go parking. Which great, I mean everybody's, you gotta fly, you gotta leave your car somewhere, that makes sense. But East Bloomington can be so much better than a bunch of parking lots. We can be so much more vibrant than that. We can have things that we can be proud of and turning what has been sitting as a, a parking lot people don't even walk around in most of the time. The cars sit there for a week at a time. Into a place where people can start their Bloomington stories, can start their families, is an enormous deal. Uh, Oxborough Hearts, uh, Heights, excuse me, another proposed redevelopment coming up on Lindale Avenue, uh, more senior rental apartments, so that not only do we have uh, the full spectrum of uh, inviting different income levels into the community, but life cycle housing, that you can grow up here, you can start your family here, you can retire here in Bloomington, and there's always a place for everyone. It's coming back to us on October 3rd. And if you've been curious what the mystery property was over on the corner over here for so long, ta-da, it is a Hyatt house. Uh, there was a little, little bit of turbulence during the pandemic in terms of how that was gonna get finished. They got it moving and that's gonna be 151 rooms uh, coming up under the Hyatt flag. And this is an absolutely huge deal. Six sensor technology staying in Bloomington, expanding its campus on the east side. They are on the cutting edge of sensor technology, not only in the United States, but globally. And their commitment to a four-phase development, not only for R&D, but for manufacturing, is a massive vote of confidence in this community. Not only because we're centrally located, but because this council, our staff, and our residents said having businesses like this in our city is something we can take pride in, it's something we want to welcome, and it's something we want to encourage.
Uh, right now, the water park at MOA, if you're curious about the status of that project. Uh, so the last major decision point with Triple Five Group uh, is that we said they needed to provide, uh, they want, needed to pursue a private financing model for the project. So they are out trying to find the financing for that right now. Uh, the issue that they've run up against is with inflation and supply chains the way they are with everything, uh, the cost of parts, the cost of steel, they're having to rerun their numbers again. So you will all know when that comes back before us and once we can take a look at the numbers again. But the thrust of both this project and every project that we consider is how are we producing how are we producing the factors that are ensuring we have a vibrant, sustainable economy that helps take tax burden off of the back of residential properties? So whether it be this, whether it be six sensor, developments of any scale, how are we ensuring that the future of the city isn't solely born on single family homes? Uh, I-494 improvements, so this is gonna be a biggie. It's a $320 million project coming up uh, in late summer of 2023 that's going to address essentially the giant mess that happens once you're heading east and you get across 35 because there is just so many on ramps and off ramps in such a small space it causes massive backups and accidents we've all seen it it's a parking lot out there most of the time so uh, they're going to be consolidating some of those access points they're also going to be improving uh, the access from 35 north over onto 494 west so whereas now you go into that tiny little clover loop and then it drops you in somebody's lap right off the top of the ramp it's gonna be more of a flyover that goes up over 35 and drops you off over by the Best Buy campus. So you have some more room to merge and get them included over there. Uh, so that project uh, is shoot, uh, shooting to be completed in 2026. And I do, I wanna do, uh, give a huge shout out to our folks at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. From the very beginning of this, they've worked with, it's called the 494 Corridor Coalition. It's most of the cities along 494. They've worked with us to figure out things like traffic management during construction to ensure while well, that's a parking lot, people aren't just jumping off onto our quiet side streets and uh, speeding through. Uh, considering the access consolidations, they've been great with helping us reach out to local small businesses that may be impacted by some of those closures. Uh, so stay tuned as this moves forward. Uh, it's been in the, the works for decades now, so nice to finally see it moving on. Uh, Expo 2027, uh, so where that stands right now, we're competing against Spain, Thailand, Serbia, and Argentina. Uh, we are not competing against the 494 improvements. <laughs> they have not yet submitted a proposal. They would be late. Uh, the uh, event itself would be from May to August in 2027. We're forecasting, uh, based on what we've seen for similar events in the United States and globally, 14 million visitors. Of those, about 7 million would be unique visitors. Uh, and really, the major, I'm excited about this for two key reasons. Uh, so first is the massive economic shot in the arm to the point about trying to reduce the overall cost burden for city operations and services on single family home residents. This is a way to help offset some of that cost. We're looking at generating about $2.5 billion worth of economic activity in the state of Minnesota as a whole and over $300 million in state and local taxes generated by that event. So on the front end, I think it's 34,000 jobs. I want to say is the most recent number. Uh, not only to put the thing up, but to operate it while it's there. So that's a very big deal and not a lot of chances a city has uh, to pursue an opportunity like that. But on the back end, I'm equally excited about what's left after the fair. So right now, the site of the fair is basically a giant empty asphalt parking lot. Has been for decades and decades. But we have an opportunity, if we're purposeful about the way that the world's this expo is constructed, all those facilities can be converted and used for the high-tech industries that are going to drive Minnesota's future. The six sensor technology is already two doors down. People are seeing the value of that area. And I understand there's concern about, uh, say, some, the way some World Cups have been run, where they throw up all these facilities just to make sure they have enough seats for those two, three weeks of the World Cup, and then you have rotting soccer stadiums in the jungle. But on the front end, we have an opportunity to purposefully and quickly develop out the single largest unused, underutilized piece of land that we have in the city. So that land is gonna develop at some point. Over time, it will develop. And it'll be on the city to do all of those streets, put all the pipes in the ground, figure out all the sanitation and management. Whereas now we have an opportunity with massive state and federal support to make all of those investments with the eye to the future. With saying after we have shown out, shown off, the tremendous place Minnesota occupies in the global economy, especially in the med tech sector, to then turn around and say, and here's your home. 
for the next generation. Here's your new office building with the parking and the pipes and the curbs and everything done to a large extent with federal money. So in the long term, it's, it's going to be there. It's just who pays for it. Uh, so who pays for it in the immediate term? getting off uh, the expo topic. I will also clarify because I've gotten some questions from folks on who is putting all of this together. Uh, so I will say Expo 2027 is a separate organization, has its own board of directors. They assembled the pitch, the bid. They're doing all the fundraising for everything. Uh, City of Bloomington is involved insofar as we would be hosting the event. So making sure that we have the logistics capability in place, the space, things like that. Uh, so in terms of uh, what the city is spending its budget on, we've set a preliminary tax levy on September 12th with a projected increase of 10.5% over 2022. I will say, I will not be voting for a 10.5% tax increase. But the bulk of that 10.5% is stuff we should have been investing in for decades now. So breaking that down just a little bit. If we changed nothing at all, we didn't hire anybody new, we just ran back last year's budget, we have a $3.7 million increase in just costs of running the city. And in large part, that's because of inflation's impact on services, supplies, uh, just keeping the pens in ink. Uh, in addition to escalating healthcare costs, what people are seeing in every single industry. So that $3.7 million comes out to, very back of the envelope ballpark, about a 5% increase if we change nothing at all. But at the same time, we're seeing pressures on public services, especially in public safety, across the metro. And I want to give absolutely enormous praise and props to the Bloomington Police Department and the Bloomington Fire Department, because in some of the most challenging years in U.S. history, they have maintained absolutely stellar service. We're actively recruiting police officers right now, and we're having gangbuster recruiting results because everybody in this region knows the Bloomington Police Department is the best of the best. And that when you put on our uniform, the city, this council, and its residents will be there to support them and get them what they need. At the same time, our fire department's been doing absolutely tremendous work. They responded to 410 calls for service in June. Now, for a city our size, it would be recommended, according to the numbers we've seen, 155 in the department to support that. We have 90. And they managed to respond to all those calls. And I, I don't mean to put Chief Seal on the spot, but I was out to dinner with uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. We were over at Hazelwood, and somebody had a medical emergency. And it was 11 o'clock at night, and who comes running in, bag at the ready, and takes care of the person on the other side of the restaurant? So A, that's a testament to how amazing our chief and the fire department is. And B, it's also a testament that we have the chief of our fire department running to medical calls at 11 o'clock on a weeknight. So... While we definitely have some trimming to do, I'd like to see this in a single digit if we can. The vast majority of this increase is for public safety services that we have needed to invest in for a while now. Uh, so in the budget, we are looking to hire six additional full-time firefighters to address, uh, address those staffing issues, uh, replace and modernize the fire stations to meet uh, the needs of the community. Uh, and that one is just a need to have. The, we just can't fit the trucks in the buildings anymore. So I hope you all had a chance to take a gander at Fire Station 3 on your way in over here. It's an amazing facility. We're working on Fire Station 4 now, and over the coming years, uh, we'll be modernizing our entire suite of stations. Uh, we're looking to add two additional police officers uh, for the workload and to meet the staffing needs and dispatch training and uh, a quality coordinator to address the challenges that we're having. Uh, and additionally, adding funds for needed body cameras, training and supplies. Uh, so I, I was on the organizing board for Heritage Days this year and putting the parade together and, and to heap some more uh, praise on the Bloomington Police Department. We were talking to them saying, hey, can we get some officers out to kind of just help with general crowd management? And they said, you know what, we would absolutely love to, but this is an overtime contract and literally we're all working overtime. That's all we're doing is working overtime just to make sure that the basic staffing at the city is covered. And you know what, when I got there on parade day, we got to the end of the route where my sole job was to tell people, don't stop, keep going. That's what they trust, trust me with. There was BPD helping to direct traffic. They made it happen. So just as much as, as we owe huge praise with the fire department, the police have been doing a, a lot with less than they should have had for a while too. Uh, so 
in terms of process, uh, the budget discussions at the council meetings will be coming up in October and November. Uh, the final levy is going to be approved December 5th, uh, and that 10.5 we passed is the maximum preliminary. So we can't go any higher than that. And again, we're trying to be uh, trying to work that back with cost consciousness uh, top of mind. Uh, in terms of artistry, uh, it's a dis disappointing situation with artistry, to be sure. Uh, and you, you may have heard about it already. Uh, but essentially, the organization was absolutely socked by COVID. Just like arts organizations across the country, obviously, they couldn't host shows. They pivoted admirably to online, but that's a whole different animal. Uh, and it hit their bottom line in a big way. And due to some very disappointing uh, financial management from the top of the organization uh, and some big misses by the board, nobody realized that until about two months ago, when all of a sudden they hit it once. So they came to uh, the city council, uh, being one of the largest arts organizations, not only in the Twin Cities, but in the state, uh, one of the longest running as well, and an absolutely core component of the Bloomington Center for the Arts, and said, okay, here is the pile of bills that are past due already. So this is work everybody has already done for us, for shows that have been put on, uh, things put in the gallery. Can we have $150,000 to cover that to get us to a point where we can provide you a plan on how we're going to turn this around, on how they will continue being the bedrock for not only the Arts Center, but the arts in the South Metro. Uh, so where it stands was uh, they received the $150,000 grant that came from Council Strategic Priorities Fund. Uh, we are discussing what the terms of a loan will be for a further 350000 with the biggest points of that being, is that going to be delivered all at once? Is that going to be chunked out over the next several years? Uh, and we'd be looking at a seven-year repayment term on that. Uh, I can't speak for my colleagues on the council, but I can say, well, I, I can speak for my colleagues on the council when I say they all want artistry to succeed. They all have spoken to that. It is an asset not a lot of cities in this country have. Everybody wants artistry to succeed. But we will be taking a very, very close eye to in this turnaround plan they're going to be presenting, how are they diversifying their revenue? How are we ensuring that they're continuing uh, to provide the high quality programming that we've come to expect from the Art Center? Because if artistry goes away, people still want the programming. People still value having a strong arts organization in the community. Even besides the main stage shows, they run dozens of lines of educational programming that are filling Bloomington Civic Plaza every day. And if they go away, that demand is still there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the plan uh, and seeing how best we can partner with artistry to return it to the organization that has been a bedrock for this community for 45, almost 50 years now. Hopefully we can get that done. All right. Okay, so I try not to linger too much on anything. I, I'm sure I failed on a couple of those. Uh, but happy to jump into questions. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Um, and some of these you might have already uh, addressed some things, but I'll let you deal with the questions as they come. But this is the first question. What is being done to reduce street racing, excessively noisy vehicles, and excessive speeding? Question mark. This includes overly obnoxious use of police sirens at night. Can more noise barriers be built along major arteries affected by street noise? Reduce or strictly enforce the speed limit on 169, Old Shakopee Road, and even neighborhoods. Crack down on unmuffled and deliberately modified noise-enhanced vehicles. I used to enjoy living here and walking through my neighborhood safely without fear of being run over by a Yahoo pulling a corner at 50 miles an hour on a crotch rocket in a previously quiet neighborhood Loop Street, speed limit 30, but should be 25 since there are no sidewalks. Sorry, that was a bit of a long sentence. I ran out of breath. <laughs> All righty. Uh, yes to all of that to an extent and i will say so I, I my dad and i have been restoring an old mustang together kind of a bonding thing it's nice to know i'm not the yahoo because that thing won't do 50. so that's nice to have that covered but uh it's good timing on this so about two meetings ago uh, we provided pretty comprehensive direction to staff on an overall new approach to traffic management and traffic calming in the city of bloomington because it is I, since the beginning of the pandemic people have been driving like crazy especially the further you're pushing into some of these quieter residential corridors, and that's not acceptable. So first off, we allocated funding back in July for an overall study of reducing the speed limit across the city of Bloomington. Because we're going to need the hard data, one, on is it going to be effective if we do do it, because that's a pretty huge lift. 
But B, we also need to do some serious research on where the hottest spots are for unsafe driving in the city so that we can best target the proactive policing, uh, pedestrian improvements to hit those safety issues where they're really arising. So keep an eye out uh, that funding was allocated for the study in July. I think it's uh, in the early stages of getting rolling and that'll come back to us again. That's the citywide speed limit reduction. Uh, we're also looking at completely overhauling our traffic management program. Uh, so it, quick show of hands, has anybody used the traffic management program? Okay, I was curious because since we launched it in 2009, one resident suggested project has actually been completed. And if you were the one person and you happen to be here tonight, that would be pretty crazy odds. Uh, but the program, it's a pretty simple idea that has a pretty huge effect in practice. Residents are on the front line, they're the eyes and ears to, uh, to notice and address these issues when they first pop up, before they become chronic issues. So in theory, a resident would be able to raise their hand, say, I'm seeing a regular issue starting to pop up where people are blowing through a stop sign in my quiet neighborhood. Staff reaches out, works to do a traffic study to see how often is it happening, how egregious is it, and then works with the entire neighborhood as a whole to say what improvements do we need to be making to, to nip it in the bud right away. Is that enhancing the stop signs themselves? Is that doing more proactive policing? Is that putting speed trailers out to catch people? Maybe they're just a little bit oblivious. So overall, we're gonna be completely redesigning the interface with the traffic management system to make it easy as a breeze to jump on when you notice something, submit the complaint, and let staff start chewing on how we get that remedied. Because the longer it takes to input something like that, the less people are gonna use it. We're also going to make it much more clear, once you're in there, once you log an issue, to see what's the toolbox that we can use to address this. Is it enhanced pedestrian crossings? Is it an issue of visibility, so we need those crossing signs with the blinking on it? Is it bad enough where we need a pedestrian island to make it a little bit easier for people to get across those wider roads? But again, if, if you don't know where to go with the complaint, well, there's a dead end right there. If you go with the complaint and it's a pain to submit it, there's a dead end right there. If you do submit it and you have no idea what good it did, there's a dead end right there. But all these things together, we can start making some serious improvements on the issues that we're seeing across the community. And I, I will also say the timing is perfect as well because we've launched, it's called the Park System Master Plan. So it's in a few decades, the first comprehensive evaluation of what improvements do we need to make within our parks so they stay relevant. But just as important is the connection between all of the parks. So as we're looking at traffic management as a whole, it's also an awesome opportunity to rejuvenate, to reinvigorate all of the pedestrian crossings between that whole network. So uh, overall, yes, absolutely. Uh, speeding is a crime and enforcement is gonna be absolutely huge, but we need to take a way more active and purposeful approach to working with residents to identify and, and build the solutions into our road network itself. So. Stay tuned on that. Next question. How were residents engaged in the decision to bid to bring the World Expo to Bloomington? Uh, I will say, so the city was working on this. They bid for 2023. That one didn't go through. So we've been talking about it for almost a decade now. And throughout all the time I was campaigning, I know I was out. I knocked on, between the two campaigns, I probably knocked on 4,500 doors, a little more. And I had conversations about it at a ton of them. Uh, we've had uh, hearings about it at council, uh, it, not to, to backtrack too much, but we used to have, they were called study sessions. So they would be off camera, they were up in this little conference room called The Hague. Things like this would, big projects would come before us and we'd talk about them for years and years, uh, kind of debating them and, and shaping them, things like that. And then it would come to a public council meeting and people would say, hey, where did this come from? I didn't hear about it. We got rid of those up in The Hague. We've moved them all on camera. So all the work that the council has been doing on Expo has been on camera, publicly accessible. All of our joint meetings with the Port Authority, uh, many of them have been right there in Civic Plaza. We set up joint tables. Uh, and I'll also say we've also vastly expanded our digital outreach opportunities. Uh, so having, obviously we've all got our phone numbers and our email on the city website. Anybody can pick up the phone and call us and people do about the Expo and many other issues. But we've also made it so much easier to directly click a button and get connected with a council member to submit feedback, digital surveys. I know, I think we had a question submitted at the last town hall saying, why are you sending me so many digital surveys? Uh, so sometimes maybe you can go too far with it. Uh, but while there wasn't a poll sent out to East Bloomington to say everybody check yes or no on this box, I'll say for six and a half years now, it's a topic I've been in active conversation with residents across the east side of our community. Uh, and their feedback has been valuable on it. This is a related question. 
why weren't residents on the east side polled about whether or not we want all traffic and increase in people close to us if Bloomington is awarded the Expo 2027, question mark, and then who is paying for the application process and Boosie and Verbrugge time and travel associated with the application process? Uh, so I'll take the second one first because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so that Expo 2027 organization, they put the entire bid together. I think they have a former Minnesota Secretary of State, one of the folks that planned the Final Four. There's a whole bunch of uh, folks from across the region that are doing that. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're kind of just playing host. In terms of the travel, I believe the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau has paid for some of that. Uh, the Port Authority has covered some of that. Um, and I think I've seen some travel uh, approvals from the City Council as well. So a little bit of all three. Uh, but again, back to in terms of uh, why wasn't there a poll sent out, I think I think it, it comes down to a matter of approach for me because the feedback I find most valuable is when people say, hey, I saw this thing, I have questions about it, can I talk to you? Or when I'm knocking on the door and I say economic development in the city of Bloomington is a huge deal, I think Expo is a major driver of that and it provides people an opportunity to have a conversation with me. I think since the beginning of this country, the way that people have had an impact in their communities was either raising their hands themselves to run for office and be a policymaker, or bending the ear of somebody who was in the seat. So uh, I, I don't know if we want to get into the approach where we send out a poll on every major issue in town. I think that could get a little sticky. But I, I will say I'm tremendously appreciative of all the folks that have, on both sides of the issue, that have provided feedback to me already because it's an awful lot of them. Next question. Is it true that remodeling fire stations would save money and meet our current and future needs instead of replacing them? Uh, remodeling instead of replacing? Uh, no, you just can't fit the trucks in the building. Uh, and at some point you end up dumping so much money into an old building, it, it's so much more expensive than just replacing it. Uh, to an extent, uh, it, overall for our facilities management system, I think we're doing a much better job than we did a decade ago about proactively planning for long-term maintenance of facilities. In fact, uh, a part of the increase we'll see on the proposed property tax levy is for additional facilities maintenance folks to be able to be proactive about, say, replacing retaining walls before they're crumbling and they're four times as expensive to take care of. Uh, so it, in terms of our fire stations in particular, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to use bubble gum and duct tape to hold together some of the most important infrastructure that a city provides that you only get away with that until something goes really wrong. Why are nearly all new ordinances, fees, programs, residents are forced to participate in, example, organics, recycling, and energy audit, voted seven to zero by the council, question mark. Who on the city council is representing residents who wish to live in a city with minimal interference from government? I do not feel represented. Gotcha. Uh, that's a, that's a good question, and it's, it's, I get where it's coming from. And I think, uh, not, not to get bogged down in a ton of process and stuff, but I think it's, it's helpful to know how things move along to an ordinance getting finalized. So every city, to some extent, engages in strategic planning. You get your staff, your policymakers together, you survey the community, you say, what are the handful of issues that we are gonna dedicate our resources and our attention to for the next one, three, five years, whatever it may be. And based off that strategic plan, your commissions, your staff come back with work plans. And they say, for the next 12 months, here's the list of five things based on what, based on the four things you all said were the most important. In number one, here's three things we're gonna work on. So when that comes back, it provides a couple of opportunities for feedback. So one, while we're putting that list of four strategic priorities together, if there's one that's super controversial or might not pass or who knows what it would be, it's probably not gonna get included because why waste a year, two year, three years of staff time to get to the finish line and say, oh, we really didn't think that through or it's controversial or it's gonna dead end. Because that's a whole lot of time you could spend on something that has a little more consensus behind it. Uh, so then it comes back in the work plan. We approve the work plan. Uh, so an example would be organics. So we've made a huge push in the city of Bloomington around sustainability uh, specifically. And we had kind of a kick in the tail on it because Hennepin County came back to us and said, the uh, garbage incinerator up in Minneapolis, the whole point is to try and take garbage, generate energy, burn it. But this wet garbage takes so much energy to burn, it's a complete wash. 
So we got to figure out how do we get all this wet stuff out of the garbage? So they mandated every city put together some kind of organics collection program that's using the HERC. And we said, okay, we could either slap something together that we know nobody's going to use, check the box, and move on, and we haven't solved the problem whatsoever. And as our garbage continues to grow up, as the city grows, it's going to end up in a landfill in Burnsville that's taller than the pyramids. And most of West Bloomington will be able to see it. So if we're going to do this, we directed staff, let's do it right. Let's figure out how we can design a program that at the end of the first year, 25% of our residents are going to use. That was the direction that we gave to staff. Staff went out, and because our, what used to be called our study sessions are on camera, residents have been able to watch over the past year and a half or so. As staff has come back two or three times, said, here's the program we want to suggest. And council has said, oh, I don't know about this aspect, or I don't know about that aspect. We've made suggestions, we've made changes. So by the time we finally came to a vote on it, we, in a public collaborative fashion, arrived at a solution that we could all support. So there are a lot of issues that end up passing 7-0 because the council has worked out our concerns with the policies before it got to that point. And I would say if this was a city where it was a coin flip, what was going to pass every night, that's, that's dysfunctional. Because there's a lot of opportunities to get to a yes before it gets there. Um, and I will say with the organics collection, I can understand uh, I can understand why that would be controversial, but I will say, even with that, we're at 24% participation right now. And I am very confident that will continue to grow. Uh, and I'm very confident that we are a leader right now in actually solving the issue that we have at the garbage incinerator instead of passing the buck to one of our neighbors. So. What is the status of the Lindell Avenue retrofit? Yeah, that's one I'm very excited about. Uh, so Lindell Avenue retrofit, we passed uh, most of the major rezoning along that corridor. And for folks that are unfamiliar with it, essentially we're trying to, we're trying to rejuvenate Bloomington's downtown. Especially as I've been out knocking doors, people have told me, I really, I, what's the heart of the east side of this community here? We have areas of density, we have areas of commercial activity, but we don't have a lot of places you'd want to go stroll around on the east side right now. Or you'd want to say, hey, let's go get the kids, we'll go walk to dinner. Lindell Avenue used to be that, and now it's mostly auto parts stores and fast food restaurants. Uh, so as we're trying to look to a future in this community where we have uh, more of the North Star taverns, more of the shanty towns, more of the cafes and performing centers, it started by taking a long-term strategic look as what do we want to be the heart of the east side of Bloomington. We had listening sessions all over town because that needed to be generated by the community. Us just telling everybody wasn't going to work. What do you want to see in your downtown? And we've rezoned all that, so now as properties are turning over and as redevelopment opportunities are coming up, a Taco Bell isn't going to get replaced with another Arby's. The Taco Bell is going to get replaced with a neat mixed-use development with opportunities on the first floor for small locally owned businesses, performing spaces, somewhere I would want to walk to. And getting back to the urgency of the, of the very apt question earlier about traffic and pedestrian safety, that's why we've got to get that stuff right now. Because you can build all the appealing parks in the world, you can have all the cool little cafes you'd want to go have a glass of wine at, but if you're terrified you're going to trip off Old Shakopee and get hit by a bus, nobody's going to walk there anyway. So uh, it's, it's a little bit longer term of a, a vision for Lindale, uh, but we've put the, the foundation stones in place for something really cool. Why did we give Public Works 1.25 million to buy 10 of the most expensive Ford trucks at 125 k each when we could have bought 20 trucks at 40 k each and still had 450 k for public safety? Question mark. Mm -hmm. What is the process to prioritize spending and how do we ensure we do not overspend on wants to require 10% tax increases to cover perceived needs? Yeah, I, to, this is a good opportunity to clarify. Uh, so as, as part of that larger commitment to sustainability, we said we need to start moving our city's vehicle fleet over to sustainable alternatives. In this case, the new F-150 Lightning electric vehicles. Uh, they're kind of perfect for the work that the city needs to do with those trucks. Um, I will say they're not $1.2 million. That was included in a line item that also included uh, a lot of infrastructure repairs. Uh, so some of the traffic studies that Public Works is doing right now that I mentioned was included in that $1.2. Uh, retaining wall improvement, kind of a lot of the mis miscellaneous things Public Works is working on. I want to say 350 for the trucks, 350,000 
for the 10 trucks altogether. So if, if we want to have a conversation uh, about sustainability generally, and uh, I will say the price difference isn't all that. I, I looked up a used 2022 F-150, and I think they're like $75,000 right now to find a used one, but that's kind of another matter. We can have the conversation about sustainability not being a priority, but if it's going to be a priority, we have to do it. I don't want this to be the city where we just say we're going to do stuff and then hope everybody forgets about it so that we don't need to be accountable. If you think it's the wrong thing to do, we can have that conversation. But the, this community has, has told me personally, rousingly, in conversations that I've had, that the future of, of this planet, and even from a budgetary standpoint, our energy efficiency are high priorities. And hearing that, I'm going to do it. And moving our fleet that direction is a good step. You might have already answered this one. What is the status of the water park? Uh, yeah, water park, uh, TBD. Depends on uh, what the mall ends up figuring out with their financing. So uh, we'll see when they come back to us. I look forward to taking a look at the numbers. You answered that one too quick. <laughs> <laughs> Who wasn't watching the hen house with the debacle of the $600,000 deficit discovered with artistry? Question mark. Is council going to put the one million ask for new concert hall on hold with these revelations? Uh, in terms of the hen house situation, uh, so I'll say again, just to underscore the actual hit to the budget itself, every arts organization in the country went through. So the fact that artistry was in a hole, I think makes sense. I mean, they couldn't do art for two years. Uh, but it is incredibly disappointing, the leadership that was shown by the executive, uh, the executive leader of that organization, who is no longer there, clearly, um, it's not acceptable, uh, and the board, frankly, as well. And the council has had some discussion uh, as part of those loan terms about making sure that there is new financial oversight in place, especially with expertise, to ensure that if we are going to move forward with getting this organization back up, we're not standing in the exact same place four or five years from now. I mean, gosh forbid we have another pandemic four or five years from now. But just ensuring that if we're giving them a launch pad for success, we know the trajectory that they're pointing at. Uh, and, and I will say again, ev everybody on the council, I think everybody in this community wants artistry to succeed. Um, but I am very much looking forward to seeing, uh, now that they have the time and, and a little bit of bandwidth to draw up a plan, what the plan is going to be that they present to us uh, so we can see if this will be a fruitful partnership moving forward. The light rail is on week 12 of its five-week closure. What can the city do to keep Metro Transit accountable, including graffiti removal at Bloomington Central Station? Yeah. Uh, so we, this has come up uh, recently at council meetings. Both we've had folks come to our uh, listening sessions that we have up on the second floor ahead of time, um, which if you haven't been able to attend, please do. It's a great opportunity to chat with us uh, and get your thoughts heard. Uh, that's come up there. I know we're having conversations with our colleagues on the Metropolitan Council uh, to get the issues addressed. Uh, there was a stretch where Bloomington was using its police force uh, to be on the trains to make sure they were a safe environment. Uh, and there was a degree of issues that's just not acceptable to have in our community. Uh, and I know Metro Transit is, is first on the list to ensure that those are addressed, but they need an accountability partner to ensure that those resources are being dedicated to our community because they've got an awful lot of rail, they've got an awful lot of buses, an awful lot of directions to send those resources, and we need to make sure that Bloomington is a top priority as one of the not only premier destinations to go to on the rail, but the premier destination to live and utilize that service as well. And in terms of the closure, I have not heard news how long the closure is going to be going. Have you heard anything, Mayor? Okay. Yeah, it's a fact. Yeah, but uh, stay tuned. We'll, we'll be bending their ear every chance we get. I think in the next uh, week or two, they're actually starting to run rail tests up and down the oh, rail perfect. line. So um, we got noticed from um, Public Works um, Friday that they were going to start doing that and doing um, intermittent closures of some of the intersections while they uh, run test trains. Good news. Yeah, thank you. Why does the city council believe we need to make it more difficult and slower to get around the city and putting so much focus on biking? Don't you know we have winter at least five to six months out of the year? I'm out walking in the winter, but there are very few residents doing the same or biking. Uh, I un understand where that's coming from as well. Um, I, I think 
To the first point, nobody on council is trying to make it harder to get around the community. I mean, that's pretty counterintuitive. But I will say I'm absolutely wanting to make it slower to get around the community. I'm actively trying to make it slower to get around the city because the speeds, as we started off talking about, are crazy. Uh, and there's a, a few different ways that, again, we're attempting to do that. With the improvement to the traffic management program, you'll be speeing, seeing more speed trailers out across the community. It's a passive way to try and support that enforcement, but people catch it and it gives them a reminder, hey, you're on a quiet street, slow down here a little bit. Uh, and to the point about bicycles, um, I, I shouldn't say, they're not last on my list of concerns, but four to three lane conversion of roads is most often when bicycles come up in conversation. Uh, especially when I'm out knocking on doors, things like that, uh, because they say, why are you doing this to put in a bike lane? I'm saying, no, I'm doing this on a place like Old Cedar because as soon as somebody slows down in the left lane to take a turn, 50% of the time the person behind them slams on the right blinker, jumps over, barely looking to get around them to not slow down. Four lane roads in this community are a huge driver of left turn crashes and rear end crashes. Uh, so just from a public safety perspective, where it's appropriate, not to say every road needs to be three lanes, but they are substantially safer where they do make sense for the number of cars that are traveling down them. And then you get all kinds of other benefits, like it's easier for pedestrians to cross them. There's less lanes to, to get across traffic and get to where you're trying to go. I, you do, you're able to have alternative or active transportation plans, what we call it now. But now we can actually, in a more effective way, connect our entire park system together. Uh, my fiance and I, we were out riding our bikes well, probably a month ago now, but we were going down Old Shakopee and I was just reminded again, I was riding up on the sidewalk, if there is a patch of sand on that sidewalk or a rock or whatever it may be, I, I'm 32 years old, I don't have the coordination to, I can barely take a corner, much less get around a rock and all of a sudden you're in traffic. That You literally have the width of the curb and you're in traffic. And there's too many roads like that across our community where we say, look at this amazing park you have right down the street, look at these restaurants we would love you to walk to, but good luck, good luck getting there. So in the longer term, uh, I, I try and take a safety first approach. But on the back end of that, we also have a tremendous opportunity to re-envision the fabric of the community. Because right now, the way our road system is built, we want you to go everywhere but Bloomington. We want you to leave as fast as possible, which is why so much uh, of our uh, Restaurants in our hospitality happen to be chains along the major highways and are concentrated in those corridors because we may, we've made it so difficult for decades and decades to just take your family and walk six blocks to the little restaurant. Uh, so yeah, overall, not to ramble about it, but safety first uh, and in doing so, we can make some really cool things happen for neighborhood vitality. Can the city work to clean up and remove graffiti in the Minnesota River Valley Refuge? Uh, I would certainly say, yeah, we could, we could partner with our friends over there, uh, put the issue on the radar. And I think this is also another good one. Uh, please do reach out to the city. If you see quality of life issues like that, whether it's traffic or whatever it may be, residents are the eyes and ears on the front line to flag that, and we can only fix what we've had flagged. Um, so yeah, if, if there's areas of serious graffiti or damage or whatever it may be, Please do let us know and we'll work with our friends over there to get it covered. Yes or no? <laughs> Will a community center be built in Valley View Park? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how many no's I've said since 2019 on this one, but I'll add one more to the pile. Uh, no, we're looking at, um, as part of the local option sales tax discussion that you may have heard about, uh, that's one of the facilities we're looking to cover is a replacement at Creekside Community Center. That would also include uh, a large portion of our public health work as well, uh, because what better way to ensure efficient service than meet the people where they're gonna be and where they're gonna be recreating. So Creekside's the site. Okay, for this question, I can throw you a lifeline if you <laughs> need it. Why are volunteer firefighters required to do medical calls, calls causing them extra stress and wearing them out? Are you trying to force us into union firefighters? Uh, it's a medical question. I'll take a lifeline. That's, that's a good one. So um, firefighters, it, part of their required training is medical training. Um, just to give you a sense of how much medical activity there is in the city of Bloomington, in 2021, Alina EMS responded to 14,000 EMS runs in the city. Um, of those calls, 
um, police and fire respond to about 7,000 of them, okay, F somewhere around in there. I'm talking averages here or, or ballparks. And we share that load with the police department. And our goal is to provide um, fast response to a citizen who calls 911 and says they have an emergency. So that's one of the reasons um, that we use our firefighters. Number one, they're trained, and number two, many times they're closer um, than um, other resources that may be responding. So it's something they have to be trained to do and that they are trained to do, and we've been um, um, doing this since about 1990 when the requirements went into place. Gotcha. And even more reason, they need the appropriate staffing levels. So an awful lot to cover. Why won't the city put RCV back on the ballot now that voters know what it is? Uh, I guess quick answer on that is I am confident in the intelligence of Bloomington voters, and I'm pretty sure they got it the first time, and they passed it. So. No, they didn't. Well, uh, okay, that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> what do you say to thousands of evangelical parents in Bloomington when you strip them of their parental rights with the conversion therapy ban? Uh, in term, uh, for conversion therapy, uh, so folks that aren't familiar with it, um, without going too far down the rabbit hole, uh, there were folks claiming to be medical providers or claiming that this was a medical procedure, that if you brought a child to them, uh, they would sort out their sexuality, uh, essentially. Uh, which was, was never going from the LGBT community, um, never going from hetero to LGBT. It was always the other way around. Uh, and just on its face is nonsense. It is not a medical procedure. There's no major medical organization in the United States or the planet that recognizes conversion therapy uh, as a medical procedure. Uh, you can still, in the city of Bloomington, take uh, your child for the religious counseling of your choice. If you feel that a spiritual advisor of whatever stripe, uh, that's something you would like to have them engage with your children in. But the overwhelming statistics of the increased rates for things like suicide, especially of teenagers that were subjected to sham doctors pretending to turn kids straight, uh, was disgusting. And that is one of the things I'm most proud of of my time on council, uh, to say what, what you want to do with your child in a religious sense, I have strong opinions on, but that's your constitutional right to do it. But do not put on a white coat and pretend to do it as a medical professional, because that's, that's gross. So. Why did you not join Council Member D'Alessandro in calling for the city manager's removal from the artistry board? Uh, well, in, in large part, because I think we're going to look at a lot of terms on that loan repayment. Uh, and I'm looking forward to making sure whatever that final structure is going to be, it's going to be one where Artistry Thrives is able to not only repay that loan, but provide huge economic uh, mobility and, and vitality in the city as a whole. 82,000 people come for Artistry shows every year. I want to make sure they have the best financial oversight possible. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, one of those possibilities is putting new financial oversight over that organization, especially folks that have specific accounting knowledge in the areas that they're gonna be taking a look at. But whatever the mechanism that we get them to that point, getting them to that point is my, is my top priority. I think it should be all of our top priority. Uh, and I think also something to keep in mind is just because somebody, and on any topic, on any topic that comes up, not just this in particular, just because somebody doesn't speak to something at a council meeting doesn't mean they don't have thoughts on it or opinions on it. Because I think we've all watched council meetings where every council member spoke to the exact same item on something, uh, which can also be a little bit counterproductive as well. So long story short, I, I want to put artistry in a place where it can succeed. And whatever terms get us to that point, uh, I'll be in support of. There seems to be a connection between the Afrique Cultural Center and money laundering, according to the FBI. Why wasn't this project looked into more closely instead of changing a code definition to accommodate it? Uh, we don't, when it comes to projects coming before the council, so this particular project uh, was a couple of uses. So it would have been a co-working space, a restaurant component, um, kind of an interesting project in, in how it was presented. But we don't assume everything's a money laundering operation. 
and we we don't have the staff or the jurisdiction to start assuming things are illegal or, or whatever they may be. So that went through the procedure that every other development would go through. Um, it was presented, we considered it, and it wasn't for that, the rezoning wasn't for that particular project either. It was coming up with the definition for a cultural campus, which now any group in the city of Bloomington could put together a cultural campus if they wanted to. I, I could think of some, some churches on the east side of Bloomington that have pitched similar ideas to me in the past. Um, so with, with regards to that specific situation, uh, you all know it's about as much as I do what I've read in the Star Tribune and they have an active criminal investigation going on. Uh, but I, I don't think we have the ability or I'm not even sure how it would work to suss out money laundering operations or assume that they're happening or, yeah, that's, it was a code change. I'm, I'm just reading these verbatim, yeah. so, okay. Why did you abstain from the vote on a community center at mm. Valley View Park instead of standing with thousands of residents in your district who fought against it? Yeah, uh, so to clarify, uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I've spoken to it at a number of venues, but uh, so way back when we were first, when I first got on council, we were looking at a place for a new community center. And because Valley View Park was in the center of some of the highest density of youth in the community, uh, the recreation facilities all around it, it seemed like a good place. Say, hey, let's put a community center there. It's already kind of the center of the community. Uh, and I will say the city dropped the ball in terms of reaching out to the neighborhoods that were directly around Valley View and would be most directly impacted. And it was one of those situations, again, because our study sessions were largely off camera. We had talked about it for months and months and months, but nobody saw it on the regular broadcast. Uh, when it came up, everybody said, wait, whoa, whoa, kind of a whiplash thing. And I understood that. And I said, guys, I don't think this is gonna fly at Valley View. I could see why it would work, but we're past the point where we could rebuild trust with the neighborhood. I think we've gotta look at new options here. And I will say, to my colleagues' credit on council, um, especially folks representing completely different sides of town that loved the idea of putting it at Valley View, they said, yeah, that's right. We, we think that was a mess, we screwed up, and that's on us. And now I think we have a better alternative moving forward to Creekside. Uh, so we, we, we've never really voted not to talk about something before. And I didn't want to start a whole new precedent to say because a group of neighbors doesn't trust we're not gonna build the community center, we're gonna have a vote to say, no, really trust us, seriously, we've moved on. Uh, we, we just don't do that with anything. And I said at that council meeting, and I will, I will clarify, this is months later. Months and months later, we moved on from Valley View, asked staff to start looking at other options. Uh, and the group still was putting up lawn signs and knocking on doors and saying, they're gonna do it. They're gonna do it in the middle of the night when you're not looking. Um, and, and at that meeting, uh, my colleague said, okay, the neighborhood really doesn't believe we're not gonna build it at Valley View Park. So let's just have the vote to officially not put it at Valley View. And I said at that meeting, I said, they're not gonna believe you. You can have the vote, but they haven't believed you yet. But then because you voted on it, they're gonna say, oh, well now that makes sense. Cool, now I trust you. So I said, you know what guys, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tap, I'm not gonna do this tap dance. We've responded to the concerns, we've moved on, this is how local government should work. Um, and I've, I've been, it's been one of the disappointments of my time on council how people continue to knock doors and saying it's going at Valley View. And people continue to put up lawn signs and people continue to make Facebook groups, scaring the heck out of their neighbors, say it's going at Valley View. Because think of what we could do with that energy productively. You've got a whole bunch of people passionate about their city, looking to make an improvement, that care deeply about their park. If everybody had half that energy, civics in America would be fixed. And instead of directing that in a way that moves the community forward, um, it's been used to spin wheels in mud that's four years in the past, almost. So I abstained on it because it wasn't gonna do much and it didn't. So. We see that Bloomington received MEI points. What is more important, MEI points or the children of Bloomington? MEI? Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, I guess I don't know much about the points. 
Uh, I'll just say in terms of, just because equity comes up as a topic, uh, something I noticed um, when I first got involved when I was on the advisory board of health was there is a measurable life expectancy difference depending on which side of 35W you live on, measured in years. Uh, there's an over $25,000 uh, annual median income difference depending on what side of 35W you live on. And there's a lot of factors that contribute that, but in large part because we have massive concentrations of communities of color on the east side that have not seen the investment. They, well, the whole east side hasn't seen the investment it should have received for decades now. And people fall behind and they fall behind and they fall behind. So whatever you think about equity, I find it personally extremely important. The fact that we have whole sections of this city that are measurably doing that much worse, and then to say, we got to pretend that's not true, we got to pretend everybody's the same. Well, that's not how you solve problems. That's not how you get investment to the right places, uh, and to the right people, uh, and to the neighborhoods that need it the most. So yeah, I'm not sure about MEI or points or anything like that, but I'm extremely proud of the work that Bloomington is doing around equity. I think we're a leader in the state and a leader in the nation on that, uh, not because it's nice to say we're doing it, but because that's how Bloomington is going to survive and it's how we're going to thrive moving forward. Is the city assisting in the Food for Our Future illegal activity investigation? I'm not sure. That would be, I don't think so. Or to whatever degree, degree would be appropriate. Yeah. No, no. How will the 18 new firefighters being hired with a grant have salaries and benefits paid? So, this is exciting news, kind of breaking a little bit right now. Uh, but Bloomington was the recipient of a federal grant that's helping us jumpstart the transition to a full-time fire department. And part of that is going to cover 18 firefighters for the first three years of their salary and benefits cost, I believe, as well. Uh, so overall, we're shooting for 155 full-time firefighters, and we're at 120. But it's, what, we're, what we're planning on yeah. is uh, about... 75 career mm -hmm. and um, 60 part-time long-term gotcha. for about 125, 130 for our total number, gotcha. which is fewer than the 155 we'd do with if we were strictly part-time because we've got people that are working more hours. So Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. So it, it's tremendous news. Uh, that's going to offset cost on the front end, but it's also important to keep in mind that we do need to think about the longer-term budgeting of supporting those costs so all of a sudden we don't have a big surprise at the end of year three when that grant runs out. And that'll also be the conversation coming back before council in October to say, okay, great, we've budgeted uh, the increases that you've seen tonight. Do we continue with that moving forward because we still have to hit those staffing levels? Or do we want to lean back on those 18 for now and come up more slowly on hitting our overall goal for firefighters in the department? Um, so it's a conversation, this is pretty recent news, it's a conversation council still needs to have, but in the end, we've got to have firefighters arriving with unacceptable response times. Uh, that's the end goal and the goal doesn't change. Do you agree or disagree with former Mayor Gene Winstead about protecting the integrity of our neighborhoods? Uh, I don't know what the context of his comment was or what he meant by integrity. I guess. Just in general, I think our neighborhoods are Bloomington's strongest asset, both maintaining kind of the quiet livability of our single family neighborhoods, uh, as well as making sure that our commercial nodes have that vitality. Because you can have, a, again, you can have a big strip of fast food joints along Lindale, but that doesn't make it vibrant. Um, so yeah, overall, I think making sure that neighborhoods have the specific investments that they need to be successful is important. I'm not sure if that's what he's talking about. What is being done about abandoned carts along American Boulevard and Nicollet Avenue in other East or and in other East Bloomington neighborhoods? Yeah, I appreciate that. And it, it was suggested by, came up a resident first again, kind of in our um, uh, council listening session. So again, if you've got ideas, please come to the listening sessions. Uh, but we, so we did a study to see where the majority of those carts were being located. We saw especially around transit areas and had started talking to the property owners over there, I think in particular Walmart's kind of the egregious party in that neighborhood, uh, to figure out is there gonna be some kind of fine system in place uh, or what it's gonna look like. Because we can go out and collect them, but then Bloomington taxpayers are on the hook for cleaning up Walmart's trash. All these carts laying everywhere. Then where do you store them? Then what happens if they don't come and get them? 
So it's, it's in the works right now. We're hoping Walmart will just take responsibility for their property and make sure it stays within that parking lot. Uh, but it is, it's on the city's radar. We're just trying to figure out how to not make this all of our problem when it's Walmart's problem. How is the city collecting the new electric scooters that are already laying around? <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, and this comes back to um, why do you all vote 7 all the time? Uh, so that, if you hadn't heard, I think it's Bird brand scooters. Uh, we're rolling out, um, you, can, you download the app and you can check them out and you can go ride them around, uh, which I like in theory as a great way for say, if you're staying in a hotel and you wanna go out to dinner, nice restaurant down the way, it's, there's uses for it. Uh, that was one of the concerns I had, was how they were gonna be laying around. Uh, Bird had said uh, a few times a day they would be picking those up. So either somebody lodged a complaint, hey, this thing's laying in my yard. Within a couple hours, Bird says they'll be there, put it on the truck and put it back at a high, uh, high utilization intersection. Um, they have 50 out to start. They're gonna get up to 150, I wanna say, before it gets cold. Um, I, I like the scooters in theory in limited areas, but I vote, that was an ordinance I voted against, just because I, I'm really trusting Bird's actually gonna show up and pick up these scooters. Uh, but if you see them laying around, if you have questions about them, please do uh, reach out uh, to Bird Corporation. You can, through their website, I think there's a button you can click to say, hey, this thing is laying here, you can take a picture of it. They'll somebody come, uh, come out and get it. And then at the end of every day as well, they collect all those, they charge them up, and then they put them out the next morning. Uh, so they've, they've worked in other cities. And again, I, I'm hoping they work here. Uh, that was just one I wasn't quite ready for. What is the new language pertaining to panhandling in Bloomington? Uh, I was gonna say, it, it's, it's come up as an enforcement issue. And again, on the front lines, if, if you're seeing somebody's in the same spot every day, it, it is illegal. Uh, but if you're seeing it's a nuisance issue, especially if they're actually like walking up and, and interacting or harassing people, please call the police department and report that uh, because it's not something that should be going on. But it is, it's a little bit of a balancing act because we just got done talking about how all of our officers are working double overtime as the norm nonstop. Uh, and I wanna make sure that the most serious issues in our community, like people, some Yahoo, come flying through a stop sign at 50 miles per hour is the priority uh, over. It's not illegal. Panhandling is not illegal yeah. in Bloomington? Freedom of huh. Well, if, especially if they're harassing people, though. harassment's illegal in Bloomington, most definitely. So if you have safety concerns about somebody approaching you, um, if somebody is repeatedly an issue, please do reach out to, to the department. Um, but again, it gets back to even if it was an ordinance, if it, even if it was illegal, if there's no enforcement, it's practically legal. So just give us, give us a heads up and we can do something about it. I'm tapped out. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, well, thank you all again so much for being here. I'll be around for a few minutes afterwards. I can give you my card if you have any questions. Uh, I'm sure you have additional questions. Please do reach out to me. That's, that's why you go knock on all these doors to do stuff like this. So I appreciate it. Thank you.